are uh, looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16 this morning as we return to Mark's gospel for about a month. Uh, leading up just to our, our summer break in June. And at that time, the other pastors and, and some guests will begin a summer series in the Psalms. And you'll spend o- almost the entire summer in the Psalms. But for now, we continue on in Mark for our 38th week. And I would remind you that, that we've recently seen something of a shift in theme in Mark's gospel. Mark had highlighted for the first eight chapters that Jesus is the promised Messiah and the Son of Man, the the Messiah of Daniel 7. He's the one who has come to inaugurate and bring the kingdom of God. And Mark was highlighting that for us, Jesus' identity as the Messiah and Son of God. But in Mark 8, the the theme kind of shifted from uh, the identity and focus of Jesus as the Messiah to specifically what the Messiah has come to do. And what he's come to do is suffer and die in the place of ruined sinners. And so with that shift in focus, Mark has also been highlighting what Jesus' disciples are called to. Jesus has been foretelling his own cross, his own death, and he's been saying that he has come to bear the cross of our salvation, but he's also been calling his own to pick up the cross of what we call Christian discipleship, the cross of following him. And he's been showing us what that means and what that looks like with particular instructions on Christian discipleship. And and, and those instructions continue in our text here this morning as Jesus addresses his people's attitude toward children and as he even shows us that children are something of an example for us in how we're to come to Jesus. We're, we're to imitate children in the way that we come to Jesus and enter into His kingdom. And this is appropriate as we celebrate Family Sunday this morning. Boys and girls, Jesus addresses you specifically here in our text this morning. And He addresses all of us to become like you in some special ways. And so this morning, as we look at what Jesus is saying here, I want us to see What Jesus is is specifically saying to you children, boys and girls, and what he's saying to all of us as it relates to the children in our midst. And so with that said, I want to preach a a brief and simple sermon here this morning from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. Let's look at God's holy word if you'd like to stand with me for its reading out of respect and honor for what God has said. Mark writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when he saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, bless and anoint the reading and preaching of your word with the presence and power of your spirit, so that we all might, like little children, come with open hands and receive what you have for us this morning in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, the big idea I, I take here from verse 14, and this is what it is. Let all come to Jesus Christ in humility and dependence. Let all come to Jesus Christ in humility and dependence. As, as I mentioned before, there's, there's kind of two audiences in that all. One is, is children. Children are included in that all. Uh, b- boys and girls The heart of Jesus is shown to us for you this morning in our text here. And what's shown is that you're invited to come to Jesus. Jesus loves you. You have a special place in his heart as little ones. Being a Christian is not just for adults. It's for you too in a special way. And and then the other is intended, the other intended audience is, is all of us. 
All of us, we are as a church meant to care for and welcome children like Jesus in the name of Jesus. And what's more is we're all to come to Jesus like little children. So those are the the two audiences, and I have two points. The first is the clear importance of children, and the second is the Christian imitation of children. First, we find the clear importance of children here. Children are important to Jesus. Boys and girls, you are very important to Jesus. You matter to Jesus. And this is made abundantly clear in our story here this morning. Verse 13 here, we find some people trying to bring children to Jesus so that he might lay his hands on them and bless them. Now, it doesn't say who these people are that are bringing the children. Perhaps it's their parents, maybe their mothers, maybe servants, uh, family servants in a household. Whoever they are, they're trying to bring some children to Jesus, but Jesus' disciples here are trying to put a stop to this. Jesus is too busy for children, they thought. Jesus is, is too important for children, they thought. Jesus is, is too preoccupied to be distracted by children, they thought, but they were dead wrong. Not because Jesus wasn't busy or important, and not because he didn't have other things to do. He, he was busy. He is important. He, has, he had plenty of many, many other things to do, but he still had time for children. J.C. Ryle said about this passage, although Jesus' time on earth was precious, and grown-up men and women were perishing on every side for lack of knowledge, he did not think little boys and girls of small importance. He had room in his mighty heart even for them. He had room in his mighty heart for children. Children and children holding a special place in, in the heart of Jesus led him to be angry here. And the disciples were trying to keep the children away from Jesus. Jesus became indignant, verse 14 says. Now, that's a big word. But it means to be angry about something that just isn't right. It's, it's the kind of thing you feel when you spend a long time, boys and girls, on, on building like a Lego city in your living room or building a fort, and then your brother or sister comes in and just smashes it all to bits. You feel indignant. That is outrageous. It's unjust, right? So you feel angry. You feel indignant. You feel indignant. Well, that's what Jesus felt when his disciples tried to keep the little children from coming to him. Why? Because Jesus loves children. He thinks you're important. There's no one too small or too young or too little for Jesus not to love them still. Jesus had time for these children because children are important to Jesus. Just like you want to spend time with people who are important to you, Jesus made time for these children. And it's hard to overstate the importance and the impact of this. You know, you might know, uh, you might not know that in, in that culture and in those days, children were not highly valued members of society. In fact, the opposite was true. The disciples rebuking uh, the, the people who are trying to bring children to Jesus would have been a, probably an expected response. In the world at that time, children were not valued. They weren't often appreciated. In fact, children were so unappreciated that there were essentially no laws protecting Jesus and laws that actually protected parents for harming their children. Uh, children were sometimes killed in those days just because their father wanted and said so. Uh, children were often killed in those days because they, they weren't the gender that their parents wanted when they were born. All, all, at that time in the world, children didn't often experience love like they experienced from Jesus here. They weren't seen as important, but they were to Jesus. Jesus loved children. And that's why Christians have been called to and often have loved children ever since. Uh, boys and girls, I want, I want you to learn about a few uh, special people from Christian history here. Um, the first is Anthony Ashley Cooper. You can hardly see him, sorry. Uh, he's also known as Lord Shaftesbury. You might have heard his name uh, in that way. Lord Shaftesbury, he lived a fascinating life uh, being grown up in, in, a, in a rather loveless home. His father was harsh, abusive, mean. But there was a woman in his home, a servant, who was a Christian, and she took special interest in him, and she cared for him as a child. And this made a, a lasting impression on Lord Shaftesbury. A one person said of this particular woman and her impact on his life that what touched him was the reality and warmth of the love which her Christianity made her feel towards him as an unhappy child. 
when Lord Shaftesbury grew up, because of this woman and, and her influence in, in his life and the way that God used it, he actually began to take up a special interest in children as well. And when he grew up, he became a, a powerful man involved with government and with the parliament in, in England. And as such, he began to labor his whole life long to help young children. You see, at that time in England, many children, even at as young as 10 years old, sometimes even younger, they worked in unsafe factories and mines, and they often did so for 12, 13, or more hours a day with no days off. So they didn't have time to spend with their families or go to church or go to school or play with their friends. They didn't get enough food to eat. They, they would sometimes often die from unsafe working conditions in these factories and mines. And when Lord Shaftesbury found out about this, he began to pour out his life, his money, his time, his energy to help these little children to be relieved from this injustice. And eventually, after a long time, he was successful. Eventually, they created laws in England to help protect these children from these unsafe jobs and unfair conditions. Another person, Mary Slessor. Mary Slessor, there she is. Uh, she was a, f- a fierce and fiery Scottish woman. And at the young age of 28, she went by herself from her home in Scotland to Nigeria to be a missionary. And she was brilliant. She learned uh, multiple languages rather quickly so that she could tell others in Nigeria about Jesus. Uh, but while there, Mary began to notice a rather horrible practice among many of the local tribes. You see, they, they thought that children who were born as twins, that this was the result of, of some sort of evil spirit at work, and this frightened many of the tribes there. And so whenever twins were born into a family, instead of taking these sweet babies home and caring for them and loving them, they would leave them out in the wilderness where they would eventually die. Well, when Mary heard about this, she was indignant she was indignant, and, and she ended up saving hundreds of twin babies from being left out in the wilderness, and she actually adopted nine of those twins herself, and she took care of many, many more, and eventually, because she educated and influenced the tribes there with the Christian faith, her work eventually led to these tribes abandoning that practice altogether and instead taking care of those precious little ones. Now, these are just a couple of examples of the ways in which Christians have loved and cared for and defended children throughout history, but we could share many, many more. We could talk about Charles Spurgeon or George Mueller or George Whitfield or Thomas Barnardo or Amy Carmichael and and many more, but, but we don't have time. And you get the point. Christians have often been a people who take a special interest in loving and caring for children. Why is that? Because children are important To Jesus, Jesus loves children. And for us as a church, as Christians, this is an important reminder. Children, children are not a nuisance. Yes, they can be loud in church sometimes. That's okay. They're not a nuisance. Children are precious. They're not a distraction. They're not a burden. They are a blessing from the Lord. They're important to Jesus, and, and, and therefore they should be important to us. I love the way this church values children. It's such an encouragement to my heart, for, for all the parents who, who sacrifice to care for their children, for all those who, who serve in Veritas Kids, for those of you who take a special interest and in, in care for kids in your community group, for the way some of you foster and adopt, it's all so wonderful. It's such an encouragement, and I wish that all the people of Veritas would in some way serve the children in our midst, all because these children are important to Jesus and loved by Jesus. And so we should seek to display his love for the little ones in our midst. Now, children, I should say to you, you're important to and loved by Jesus. He shows that so clearly here, doesn't he? he in the way that he welcomes these little ones, he welcomes them into his arms. It's just such a sweet picture to imagine. He welcomes them into his arms. He embraces them and he lays his hands on them and he blesses them. And children, Jesus shows that you are important to him. But what's more, he's shown it all the more clearly in his saving work, that, that he loves you. He's, he's shown this most clearly and powerfully in that he came for you. Although he's almighty God, who's known nothing for eternity past but the praises and pleasures and perfections of heaven, he came to become a little child for you. And what's more, he came when he grew up to die for you. Those same arms 
into which he welcomed these little children here. They were stretched out wide on a cross, and there he suffered, he bled, he died, so that he might welcome you into his arms. That's how important you are to Jesus, that he would consider you worth suffering for, that he would be crucified and die for you so that you could be forgiven and so that you would get to be with him forever and ever in the new perfect world that he's preparing for us. Isn't that amazing? You're so sweetly loved by Jesus, little ones. This is clear. And now what he commanded the disciples is an invitation to you because of all this. Let the little little children, let the children come to me. Children, Jesus is inviting you to himself here, to trust in him, to believe in him, to to receive him into your life and to give him your life in turn. He's inviting you to be baptized and to follow him all the days of your life. And you should. You should because there's no one who loves you more or better than Jesus. No one at all loves you more or better than Jesus. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards once said. He said, the love and grace that Christ has manifested does as much exceed all that which is in this world as the sun is brighter than a candle. In other words, Jesus' love is so much better than any kind of love you can ever experience. It's better, it's greater as the sun is greater and better than a candle. And then he says, parents are often full of kindness toward their children. But there is no kindness like Jesus Christ's. Do you understand? Jesus loves you more or better than... Your your parents love you. Your parents probably love you more than anyone else on this earth does, but no one loves you. It doesn't even compare. Jesus' love is so much greater. Jesus' love for you is so much greater. So come to him, trust in him, begin to follow him all the days of your life. And that call to come to Jesus in this way is not just reserved for children, as we know. It's, it's, for, it's for all of us. We're all to come to Jesus, but we're called to do so in a specific way according to Jesus here. Look with me next at the Christian imitation of children. Jesus says in verse 15, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Here, Jesus widens his audience to all, and he says to all that if you would come to him, you must come like little children. Whoever would come to Jesus must come like a child, or you won't enter at all. And, and this is an emphatic statement. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't see it in English here, but it very literally says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, he will not not enter it. It's emphatic. There's two no's here. So we might translate it, you will certainly not enter it. If you would enter into the kingdom of God, you must receive it like a little child receives a gift. Now, now part of the way that some people have interpreted this in the past is to say that children are just naturally innocent and that they're just automatically included in the kingdom of God because of that, just simply because they're children. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't say that Jesus or that children are automatically uh, belong to his kingdom because of their innocent nature or natural faith or anything like that. Uh, we know, based on other scriptural texts, that all are actually born in sin. From birth, we all have inherited the guilt of Adam, and in him we've inherited a corrupt nature inclined to sin. Romans 5.19 says that as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners. That's us. We're all born in sin and guilt and corruption. We can all say with David in Psalm 51 that in sin did my mother conceive me. Apart from Christ, we're all guilty and condemned before God and corrupted within. And of course, those of us who have spent any amount of time with young children, even from an early age, Know that no one is born naturally righteous and good and honest and pure. We see this in young children as soon as they're capable of moral action. As soon as all of us have opportunity, we show ourselves to be sinners in need of salvation. Even from an early age, this is made clear. And so Jesus can't be saying that children automatically belong to God's kingdom. No, he's simply saying the kingdom belongs to such 
as these. And he says that anyone who would receive the kingdom and come to Jesus must receive the kingdom like a child. So these are two statements about the way that people must enter in and receive the kingdom of God, come to Jesus. It's not a statement about children belonging to it automatically. It's, it's, again, children. Let me talk to you here. This invitation comes to you, but you must receive it. You must come to Jesus in faith and trust. You don't belong to him automatically simply because your parents are Christians or because you come to church or because you're a child. You must come to Jesus and trust in him to receive his kingdom. You must come to Jesus for yourself, and that's true for us all. We must all come to Jesus. And, and, and then the honor that Jesus bestows to children here is that any and all who would come to him must come mimicking or imitating being like a little child. We must imitate little children in the way that we come to Jesus. Now, what does that mean? What about children are we to imitate in our coming to Christ? This word receive seems significant for helping us understand this here. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now receive, that's, that's the language of gift, isn't it? You, you, don't, you don't earn gifts, you receive them. You don't work for gifts. Gifts are not wages, gifts are not due. They are freely given and received. And boys and girls, there's a difference between the money or the privileges that you get in your household as a result of doing chores and receiving gifts on your birthday. Isn't there a difference between those two things? One is, is you're earning, but on your birthday, you're given gifts. They're free. You don't earn them. They're a gift that you receive. Well, likewise, it seems to be significant for what Jesus is saying here about those who would enter the kingdom of God and, and imitating a child in doing so. Uh, children at that time didn't have any rights, didn't have any privileges, had no standing whatsoever in the world. If they were to have anything at all, it could not be on the basis of their rights, it could only be a gift. And so to receive the kingdom of God like a child would then mean to receive it with humility and dependence as an utter gift, not as wages, not as what's due. I love what James Edwards says about this. Listen to what he wrote. It says, in this story, children are, are not blessed for their virtues, but for what they lack. They come only as they are, small, powerless, without sophistication, as overlooked and dispossessed in society. To receive the kingdom of God as a child is to receive it as one who has no credits, no clout, no claims. A little child has absolutely nothing to bring, and whatever the child receives, he or she receives by grace, on the basis of sheer neediness rather than by any merit inherent in them. Little children are paradigmatic disciples because only empty hands can be filled. If you would come to Jesus and receive his salvation, receive his kingdom, you, you must do so, having renounced any and all rights to do so. When it, when it comes to entering the kingdom of God, your spiritual resume is a liability, not a qualification. You cannot earn it. It is only a free gift. Only those who come in humble reception and dependence, only those who come in meek faith and trust enter into the kingdom of God. You can't come any other way. You can only come like a child receiving a gift. I love this song by Carolyn Cobb. It's called, There's a Mountain. And then it, these, these beautiful lyrics are sung. She says, there's a mountain only the lame can climb. There's a table only the hungry find. Only the beggar will have the currency when need is all you need. There's a victory only the conquered gain. There's a glory you get when you give up your name. Oh, the peace when you finally yield your fight and in surrender rise. Come with open hands in need. Come hearts broken, bended knee. A gift can only be received. A gift can only be received. Children, adults, all. Come to the Lord Jesus in humility, independence, for the first time or for the 
thousandth time, come to Jesus with humility, independence. Your worthiness is not what gets you in with him. Your status is not what gets you in. Your good works don't make you acceptable. There's nothing you can do or have that can outweigh your sin and guilt. Don't come bearing your resume, your good name, your good works. Come with open hands saying, I've got nothing else, and simply receive the free gift of God's kingdom and salvation won for you in the cross of Christ. Jesus was the only one worthy to enter God's kingdom, but he was worthy on our behalf so that we can discard our own imagined worthiness and count entirely on his, which he gives us freely in himself. Come to Jesus in humility and repentance. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would humble us by your Spirit as we hear this word. Humble us by your Spirit so that we would know that there's nothing that makes us worthy, that there's nothing we can do to earn or deserve your kingdom. It's given freely and graciously on account of Christ. Help us all to depend on him entirely, not to bring our resumes, our good works, our our good names, but to Rest entirely on Jesus, on his good works, on his good name, on his resume. And help us to realize that it's all him and not us at all. Help us to come in in meek faith and trust and humble dependence upon him entirely, Lord. We know that the temptation, even for those of us who have been following Jesus for a long time, to think that there's something else. Uh, we struggle with, with thinking that there's something else that earns us a right to approach you, but there's nothing. There's nothing, and we confess that now. And we ask for forgiveness for, for, for our pride and for our, our, our uh, lack of humility. Help us, Lord, to realize that it's only Jesus, and to come like little children and receive his free gift of his kingdom and salvation in him. Lord, we we love you. We thank you for giving us this free gift. We thank you for making a way when we could not make our own. We thank you for making a way when there was no other. We pray that we would not be uh, concerned with why there's only one way, but that we would be thankful that there is a way and that, that we would walk that way ourselves in Christ and in the power of his spirit. We pray that as we come to the table, we would come with empty hands, and receive the free gift of Christ's broken body and shed blood. Receive it into ourselves and, and, and walk renewed in newness of life. To walk in humility and humble faith. Walking with him all of our days until we see him at last in glory. We pray in his name. Amen.